Hey, what's going on everyone? Welcome back to the Snowbike channel. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. We're going to be putting together a lot more snowbike related content and primarily aimed at new riders, um, getting into the sport, wanting to learn more. And that's really what today's video is about. Today's video is going to be about building your first snowbike and you know, if you're new to the sport and you're coming in, there's a lot of information out there and it can feel overwhelming. And um, when you're looking around on social media, you could see a lot of, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollar $30,000 snow bike builds and think to yourself that you have to pour all kinds of money into a snow bike to, uh, to get out there and have fun. And that's far from the truth. There's um, plenty of folks that I ride with, including myself, that keep our bikes pretty stock, pretty simple. And there's really um, only a few things that I would consider that are mandatory or, or essential for your snow biking build. Um, and so that's what the video is going to be about. I'm going to first start off with a very brief overview of things that you should consider adding to your snow bikes. And then I'm going to transition into things that are nice to have. And um, I don't want to dissuade people from thinking that you have to spend all this money to get into snow biking. That's far from the truth. And so that's really what this video is going to be about today. I'm going to go over the things that I've done to this bike. And then I'm also going to try to do my best to not just show you the things that I've done to the bike, but also give you a broad sense as to all of the products that are out there, all of your options, because that's kind of the cool thing about these snow bikes is there's not really any one thing that you have to stick with. There's a lot of different manufacturers out there that are making great products and achieve the same results. And so um, a lot of those products I've used before in past builds. And so I will do my best to give you an unbiased opinion on what some of their failures were and what some of their successes were. So before we get started, I guess the first thing that I want to discern right off the bat is just the difference between the enduro bikes and the motocross bikes. And particularly what I'm talking about is um, the, what I'll refer to as the headlight bikes. They're all the bikes that the Austrian group, KTM, Husky, Gas Gas, um, put out there that are in some states street legal and you can put plates on them. And so with that, the industry has had to make those bikes um, emission compliant. And so they run awfully lean. And when you go to snow bike, the headlight bikes, um, you're putting a tremendous amount of load on the engine. You're subjecting it to a wide temperature range, you know, with snow and being out in the cold. And those bikes um, will have different considerations than what I would recommend for motocross bikes. And so I'll do my best to differentiate between the items I'm talking about today so that if you have a headlight bike or if you have a motocross bike, um, hopefully you'll be able to, to tell the differences between some of the recommendations that I'm making. And you know, with that, if I fail to do so, just please leave a comment and uh, I'll jump on it quick and try to help answer your questions. So let's get into it. All right, so one of the first things that we do to our snow bikes when we go to build them is add thermostats. And if you have a headlight bike, you're probably asking yourself, well, wait a minute, we already have thermostats. And you're not wrong. Um, your bikes come with OEM thermostats. Uh, the only problem though is that the housing of the thermostat itself is made of plastic and you can't easily add uh, temperature sensors to them. There's no port to add the temperature sensor. It's also difficult to add heated handlebars to the, uh, the thermostats too as well. And so a lot of us, we opt to buy aftermarket thermostats and there's a couple companies out there that, that make these. Um, this is a Wattman product called the Thermobob. Um, they were the originator of uh, aftermarket thermostats for motorcycles. And uh, then C3 also has their thermostat and Timber Sled as well has a thermostat. And the idea of a thermostat really is to um, 
bring up the temperature of your bike evenly and also maintain a nice minimum temperature. And so for four strokes, we're all shooting for about 180 degrees. And a good operating range is uh, 170 all the way up to 200. Uh, anything beyond about 230, you'll boil over and lose coolant. And the aftermarket thermostats, um, you know, the assembly of it, this, this one is a little bit strange in that it's U-shaped. This is for a two-stroke. And if you're building a two-stroke, I've got a great video on two-stroke builds. Check that out. But um, generally for the four-strokes, they're differently shaped. The inlet will come in on one side and the outlet will come out the other side. And um, the brass fitting that you see here, this is going to be a part of your bypass loop. And so when the thermostat is closed, your coolant then is going to um, go through the bypass loop and then back to the engine. And you're gonna cut your lower coolant line and add one of these couplers to basically redirect coolant back towards the engine. And when you go to mount, when you go to buy one of these and you go to mount the Trail Tech temperature gauge, um, put it somewhere up in the handlebars so you can see it and monitor it closely. And Trail Tech, they have uh, two different temperature sensor probes. This is the one that you want. This is the threaded probe that will go directly into the thermostat. They do make this style as well that fits inside of your radiator fins. And they work, but they're not as great as um, the threaded style. And with that, um, the next consideration that you're going to have to make is compatibility among all of the different fittings across a variety of brands of heated handlebars. And so later on down the road, if you decide to add heated handlebars to your bike, which I highly recommend, um, you're, just make sure that there's no compatibility issues across your thermostat and the handlebars. Um, a lot of times, like the Wattman Thermobob, um, you can take this brass fitting out if you don't want to run a silicone hose and you want to run like C3's um, push connect, the push connect fittings. You can do that. You can take out that brass fitting and run this fitting to accommodate your C3 heated handlebars. Uh, vice versa, if you had a C3 thermostat and you wanted to run someone else's handlebars, um, you could just change the fittings and, and uh, be on your way. But with that said, just make sure that when you start off, you're, grab, you're, you're getting the right uh, fittings, thermostats, and the handlebars. And um, my go-to, my, my personal favorite in terms of handlebars, fittings, and hose, hoses are the Selkirk fittings and hoses. They use these AN style fittings and you do use um, some thread sealant for the threads on your handlebars and on the thermostat, but you do not use them for the fittings right here. And they're just a, uh, a really great hose, really great fitting. I've never had any issues with them leaking and they're flexible. You can route them, you know, in tight spaces and they're burly. I mean, this is like braided line that's rubberized. It's got a coating on it and uh, super rugged, super great, highly recommend it. Um, but, you know, the choice is ultimately up to you as to whether or not you want to run uh, the push connect hose, which is like this here. And, you know, people love running this stuff. Um, the, the failures that I've seen are primarily um, when you go to install these for the push connect, there's actually a tiny little O-ring inside of here. If you ever take one and look inside of there, there's a little small o-ring and what's happening is people when they go to cut the ends of this um, they're not putting a nice little beveled edge around 
the outside and this plastic, it's pretty sharp. And when they go to insert it into the fitting to set it, they're uh, nicking that O-ring and, and that's a $10 fitting, now that's junk. And so um, I'm not a big fan of that system and that setup. I've seen and dealt with enough of them that I'm just, I'm over it. And so um, I no longer use the style fitting with that hose. Um, the other alternative, and it's not a bad alternative, is again, just to run the brass fittings with hose clamps and use silicone hose. The only downside to that is the hose that you generally pick and use are, are large and they might not fit through tight areas as well. They might not bend as well. Um, so those are the three options. Um, you know, the C3 line, use uh, just standard barbs with silicone hose or use Selkirk's system of uh, 3AN fittings and this hose. And I haven't found anything that works better than that yet. Okay, so what we have in front of us is a 450 SXF from KTM. And this of course is the motocross bike. Um, earlier I'd mentioned headlight bikes and if you have a headlight bike, one of the considerations that you should consider with your bike is the fueling. Again, I had mentioned earlier that the um, headlight bikes were a bit lean for snow biking. And to really take control over that matter, there's sort of three options out there available. One is a, um, what we call a fuel program or piggyback. And there's a variety of companies out there that make these. Uh, JD Jetting has their own, Dobeck, um, CMX I believe has their own. There's a variety of companies. They're all essentially Dobeck units, but people like to put their own brand label on it. And all those units are doing is um, allowing you the cap capacity to take away and add fueling trim to your fuel injection. And there's no real map per se that you're working with. Um, it's just allowing you to, again, take away and add fuel. Uh, the third option is a, another fuel programmer that's by um, DinoJet, and their power commanders are similar in that they allow you to take control over the fueling and ignition, um, but they also have some other features that are kind of neat. And one of their new features now is the ability for an auto-tune. And so what that does essentially is uh, you'll cut a hole in your, your header pipe and add an O2 sensor. And that O2 sensor will basically sniff the, the air to fuel ratio and make on the fly adjustments to correct for fueling parameters. And uh, it's kind of a slick setup. I've, I've not used it in the snow bikes. Uh, I've used it in other, other builds and other bikes but not this particular bike. The last option, of course, is aftermarket ECUs. And the advantage there is that hopefully you're finding a reputable dealer to buy those from, and they are going to preload their dyno-tested maps onto the unit. And a lot of these uh, ECU, ECUs now, such as um, Taipan from AIM, Athena Get, uh, Vortex, they all allow you to take control over the fueling. And so um, one advantage though going with the Athena Get is that you'll actually be allowed to, uh, to modify the ignition curves as well. And some of these units have Wi-Fi capabilities so you can hook up to your phone and be able to make these parameter changes yourself. Um, now with that said, with the the motocross bikes, I'm kind of switching gears here now, and I'm going to go back to talking about motocross bikes. The ECUs in these bikes from the factory are pretty good. You know, in the snow, they can run a little rich at times, particularly when you don't have good engine temperature management. And we'll go over the jackets next and how to, to maintain the temperatures on your bike. Um, there's a lot of new products out there nowadays. Selkirk is what I have um, here on this bike. 
And I've used this setup now for the last uh, three or four years and it's, it's worked excellent. Um, C3 also has their skins coming available. That's kind of new this year. So I want to maybe wait and see how those perform. Um, and then there's, you know, PST makes their own engine jackets. And if you're building a budget bike and, and you want to save a little money, um, you can order this material, material here from Big Duck Canvas. And it's a fire retardant vinyl. And it's like $12 a yard. You get yourself some brass grommets and some bungee balls. And then you can, you can build up your own. Um, pretty simple, pretty cheap if you want to go that route. Uh, in my opinion, the Selkirk product is great. Um, when you sit down and pencil out the math for what it's going to take, if you go with the engine jacket, you're still going to want to cover this header pipe with um, P3 makes a nice carbon um, cover for these. If you don't, you're going to burn a hole in your pant leg. And when you sit down and figure out the math of buying an engine jacket, buying a pipe guard, buying a skid plate, you're going to be into it for about 400, 500 bucks. And, you know, one common complaint with the Selkirk armor is that it's expensive. And when you sit down and pencil out the math, it's, they're about the same. Um, so one of the limitations that I've found with the Selkirk armor is if you ride these bikes really hard and you're jumping them and having a good old time, um, down on the bottom of the bike, they have a heat exchanger. And this heat exchanger kind of lives right here down the skid plate. And now two years in a row, I have actually cracked these heat exchangers. And I think what's happening is when I'm hitting jumps really hard, the, the bike itself is, you know, twisting and flexing in such a way that the engine armor too is twisting and flexing. And in return, what's happening is it's cracking these heat exchangers. It happens about once a year now. It's super frustrating. And um, I'm to the point now where I'm either going to just completely remove this or just carry a spare, and then when it breaks out in the field, just be prepared to, uh, to run back to the truck and then swap it. Um, again, this has only happened twice. One time I didn't observe any hit to the bike. The second time I did hit a pretty good stump, and in my mind it warranted this braking, but it is a failure point in the field just to be, uh, you know, just to know about, so. Other things that I consider, you know, really important for your first build is to add some of these fork skins. The fork skins, you want to get the long ones and the long fork skins. Um, Seal Savers makes them and then this company, PC Racing, also makes them. You want to get the long ones and protect those seals, the cold. You know, going from the cold back into your heated shop really just wrecks havoc on those seals. And uh, so you want to try your best to protect them from snow and ice and water. Uh, so radiator blockouts. On really cold days, really deep days, I add these radiator blockouts. And it's just um, Kydex material or UHMW. I've seen people use um, cutting boards and, and whatever kind of material you can find. And I just made it this way so that it's quick and easy to pull out, quick and easy for me to put in. These go directly in front of the radiator and they just snap down in place. If I'm riding and I notice my engine temperatures are getting a little hot, then you know I'll reach down, maybe pull one up you know, halfway and let the bike cool down. And then when I'm done with it, you know, just 
just push it down back into place. Um, and if you have to, you know, take them out completely, you can do that as well on days when it's a little warmer. Um, if you do choose to run the Selkirk kit, I would definitely recommend adding a fan. And on warmer days, the bike will get warmer, but you set up the, uh, the fan to kick on at about 200 degrees, and then that will help cool your bike down. And one consideration for these bikes is the stators on them do not have a great deal of output. And if you go to add, you know, a fan, lights, a Trail Tech Voyager Pro, some other accessories, one consideration is that you're going to eventually run out of uh, wattage from your stator. And you're going to either have to upgrade your stator or simplify the amount of electronics that you're adding to your bike. And in my more recent years, my mindset has slowly changed from, you know, building these really sweet built up bikes with all the, the doodads to now I'm all about keeping things simple, keeping the electronics simple. And uh, the nice thing with these Tusk fans is that they only use like 15 watts. And so while you're using the fan, you know, it's not gonna draw down any power from your battery and, and kill your battery. And the other neat thing about it too is that the fan itself is fully programmable. Um, so you can set different trigger points for the fan to come on or off. So let's talk about intakes. Uh, a lot of different intakes out there. C3, Timber Sled, Air Force Velocity Stack, they all have their, their own intakes. And lately I've been come, become a huge, a huge fan of these um, Velocity Stack from Air Force. And mostly because the whole thing is built out of rubber, so you're not gonna have buildup of frost. You know, some of the metal intakes, I worry that with that kind of bell effect, there's so much velocity coming into these things that with the right humidity and the right temperature, you could build up frost on the edges of the bell. Um, this rubber, you're not gonna have that, that happen. Also, it's a softer rubber compound, and so while it's in there, you know, it's shaking, it's jittering, it's, it's you know, allowing snow to pop off of it. Um, they also add a spot for your ambient air sensor, which is pretty nice. And then they're also doing some pretty trick stuff with uh, injector relocations. And so you can add a second injector if you like. Um, overall, really happy with this product. This is what I run in the, uh, the 450. And um, these newer bikes in particular have smaller air boxes. And this is the smallest intake that I've found. C3 also has a pretty small intake as well. Uh, another thing to consider getting, or I wouldn't say consider, I would say mandatory, particularly for people that run their bikes. You know, if you're loading your bike in a trailer, um, this might not be as big of an issue if you've got a heated trailer, but for me, I like to, uh, to load my bike in the back of my truck a lot, and I go on these, you know, two to three hour drives, and the bike gets wicked cold, and when you get to where you're going, you know, it's eight or nine in the morning, these bikes are tough to start. And sometimes what I'll use is a jump pack. Noko makes a great little jump pack. And then I'll add a battery dongle down uh, from the battery so that I don't have to take the seat off. In the morning, I can just hook up and use this to jump the bike. And that's the only time that you'll use it. Once the bike is warm and the battery is warm, you'll be fine for the rest of the day. Um, definitely recommend carrying this in your bag, your backpack, um, just in case somebody has a dead battery, this will save your bacon. Another thing uh, to consider doing is on the valve cover right here, there's a vent tube. And normally this vent tube goes straight down and uh, ends up down here right in front of the track. And 
<clears throat> you can see it there. And sometimes that vent tube will get plugged up with snow and ice. And if that happens, you risk building up pressure in your valve cover here and you'll blow out this rubber seal. And some people think this is the head gasket, but this is just a, your gasket for the valve cover. And um, so to prevent that from happening, I'll buy a small plastic T and then add it right here and then run a short stretch, maybe six inches long, and then put one of these uni filters on it. It's a $20 mod. It will save you someday. If you don't do this, you might find out the hard way what happens. Um, so definitely a mod that you would, you'd want to do. Um, and I, I place it right over the exhaust here so that if oil is dripping out of here, I can smell it. Uh, if you flip your bike over and you go to flip it back over, sometimes you'll notice it'll leak a little bit of oil right here. Not a big deal. You know, you're, you're usually losing just a slight amount. If you start to do that two, three, four times in one ride, you might lose enough oil that you want to consider adding a tiny bit. Um, the capacity on these, uh, these bikes is pretty low. And so, you know, if you lose 100, 200 milliliters of, of oil, you know, that's a significant enough amount that um, you might not be getting proper oiling to all the, the various parts in the engine. So I think that covers all of the things that I consider are, you know, essential for a 450 build. I'm gonna switch gears now and talk about things that I think are nice to have and you know, I'll discuss various products that I think, um, you know, really add to the enjoyment of snow biking. And the first thing I'll talk about is the Selkirk Armor again. Um, you know, it, the downside to ordering one of these is they, the company takes some time to get, you know, it could take two or three months. And if you're starting the season right now, or you're midway through the season, um, I wouldn't place a great deal of faith on getting one of these very quickly. It could take a couple months. And so with that said, you might just resort to using the PST jacket or building your own and that'll work just fine. Um, heated handlebars, man, heated handlebars is so nice. And <laughs> the first couple of years I didn't have them. And then as soon as I added them, I was like, what the heck have I been doing this whole time? Definitely recommend getting coolant heated handlebars. Uh, the electric hand grips are kind of hit or miss. Some companies build some good ones. Again, you're taking power away from your stator, so just keep that in mind if you decide to use electric grips. Um, Selkirk makes these heated bars. They're, they're awesome. And uh, one thing that I've gone to lately is using these um, Cheetah Factory Racing, the CFR SX bars. These were specifically made for, for snow biking. They've got a really heavy bend right here. And because of that, they actually add, I have to look, I think it's about two to three inches of a rise. And so I used to just always buy C3's handlebar risers to get the right ride height for me. And now my new go-to is to not buy the handlebar risers, buy the SX bar bend. It's a little higher and it just, you know, saves you from having to add more parts to your bike. You can use your stock bar risers and uh, they work great. Um, when you go to modify your air box, you know, you can get away with using your stock air intake. And if you do that, what I recommend doing is visiting this company here, Autowares, and finding the pre-filter for your bike. And it's a slip-on filter that's gonna go over your foam filter. And that will work just fine. You'll have to um, pay attention to the amount of moisture on your air intake and on the foam. If that foam filter gets too much moisture and it's cold out, it'll eventually freeze 
and you'll start to suffocate the bike's airflow. And when that happens, you'll hear it, you'll feel it, and you'll have to pop open your airbox and then get in there and try to remove all the snow. Um, what I've done here is cut away the airbox. And again, I'm running the Air Force Velocity Stack. And I like to double bag these, you know, put two, two filters on. Some people like to um, use the Kiwi brand quick dry camp spray that's basically a waterproof repellent. Um, I haven't done that. You know, you can buy these from outerwear that are already sprayed with something that's a, a water repellent. Um, so if you run this setup, you know, you're going to cut away the airbox. And Selkirk does make a great airbox. They, they cut out this back end here and then they add this Kydex material to the back side so that it prevents snow from entering the airbox, but it allows snow to slide out. And uh, it's really a great design. If you go that route, you can buy their airbox or build your own and then pick up a second one for summer. If you're converting your bike back and forth, I'd probably just own both air boxes. Uh, so shocks, you know, as soon as you start jumping these things, um, I'll, I'll talk about the headlight bikes again. You know, the headlight bikes, the Enduro models, generally the, the shocks that they come with from the factory are very soft. And they're a little too soft, in my opinion, for snow biking. You have to remember that the, from the factory, these bikes are meant for riders in the 187 pound range. And by the time that you jump on these with your gear, your avalanche bag, your shovel probe, all the stuff, you're probably adding you know 30 pounds to yourself. And the bike itself, the geometry has changed. You're adding weight to the bike. And so for the Enduro models, the forks that are on the bikes are generally too soft. And I would recommend um, a few things. You've got some options. Uh, you can send off your forks to a, a professional, have them revalved or resprung. And often um, it's pretty affordable. I think most, most people charge 300, 400 bucks. Uh, Brockstar here, he does a great job on building his forks. And I think actually here, I just heard a rumor on uh, Black Friday, he might be offering a, a special. And so I'm, you know, for three to 400 bucks, you're looking at getting snow bike specific shocks. Um, again, if you've got an Enduro model headlight bike, I would strongly recommend considering getting some different resprung forks. One other option uh, for primarily folks that are using the, uh, the headlight bikes, a lot of us want to be able to transfer back and forth between snow bike in the winter time and then having the bike for the summer. And if you run the snow bike forks, they might be a little bit too, too firm for the summertime. And so another option is Timber Sled makes a really nice third timber sled trio that fits right here and it takes oh five to ten minutes to install you'll need to buy the upper clamp that fits right here and then you'll just simply remove this spacer and the lower end of the shock strut will fit right here and what you'll end up with is a, a nice mod to basically firm up the front end and come summer, you know, if you're wanting to use the bike, um, nice and easy to take it off. And so that's a second option too as well. Um, for the motocross bikes, they come a little stiffer and a lot of people can get away with running the stock forks. Uh, if you're starting to get a little sandy and you want some more bottoming out protection for, again, for the price, you can't beat uh, what Brock has done with these. He's done a fantastic job, um, kind of sold on, on his, his setups here. That's going to be the, the go-to from here on out. Um, 
So seats, uh, there's a couple different options out there for seats. Seat Concepts makes a great seat. Uh, there's also Fisher. I ran Fisher a few years ago and um, some of the li limitations on, on those seats is just the price of them is a lot more expensive than these. They take forever to get and the material that they use is too slippery. And I ended up just switching to, to seat concepts. They just have a better seat. And um, you know, if you've spent any time on these stock seats here, you'll know that they're thin, they're hard, and out in the cold, they're pretty abusive <laughs> on your on your lower back. And so uh, you know, for comfort, you're spending a lot of time on these bikes. Those the seat concepts, this is the element. They have two different, they have an element and a comfort. The element is more of a waterproof seat. And uh, this is their XL, which is their widest seat. And I like this seat because it maintains a really thin profile in the front. So when you're getting after it, you don't feel like you have a bulgy seat. But then when you want to sit down and you want comfort, you can just sit back a couple inches further back and you've got a couch. All right, so foot pegs, definitely want some good foot pegs. Um, I just, you know, I used to always buy the Flow snow bike pegs and uh, you know, there's some other manufacturers out there that make good foot pegs. I stuck with these on, on the 2023's KTM, started adding larger foot pegs and I haven't found a need to upgrade the foot pegs. These are, these are great, they don't seem to load up with snow and uh, yeah. For lights, again, one of the limitations on the motocross bikes is they don't come with a light and you've got a small stator. Now on the headlight bikes, you've got a headlight, um, but if you're running any kind of storage bag up here, you might not have access to use it or you'll have to pull it off and, and put your bag somewhere else. What I found works really well is the Skilak products lights. These things are wicked awesome. They're super bright. The battery pack on these uh, will last the whole evening. You know, if they, I think it's got like 12 different settings. I've got a whole review video on this light. You can check that out, kind of go over the specifics of it. But, you know, we sat down and we compared them to uh, Oxbow and Task Racing, and this light just blows them out of the water. Just brighter, bigger battery. And one of the cool features about it is it actually you can reverse charge. So, um, you know, if you've got a dead phone out in the field and you're trying to get a hold of somebody, as long as you've got your charger cable, you can uh, charge up your other electronics with it. And they have some unique mounting solutions. You can mount them on any GoPro or uh, it comes with a little handlebar mount. And the whole housing on this is aluminum and this base is aluminum and it just slips on like that and it's a pretty sturdy mount you got to take it off pull it off so quick and easy super bright you could put one of these on the bike and put one on your helmet and that would be the ultimate combination being able to see where you're looking and where your bike is pointing all right what else is there to cover tss if you haven't already upgraded, man, this soft strut, the new soft strut from Timber Sled, is the bee's knees. This is the ultimate in, uh, you know, being able to quickly, without tools, customize the riding behavior and characteristic of your kit. And the QSL now allows you to lock it out completely over here in the red, um, or go softer. And so if you've got a long trail ride with whipped out, you know, a worn out trail, you can put it in the soft mode and have a pretty cush ride. Um, so if you are running the older TSS or the solid strut, uh, I would say it's a worthy upgrade. It's gonna definitely, uh, you know, help you out in terms of, 
just comfort and then also it's going to give you a little bit more flexibility and and how the kit behaves and how the bike behaves in a deep snow and and on trails uh i'll go over some storage options right now i've got this timber sled riot bag and i really like this bag it tucks up in a nice spot it's easy to get to i keep my tools in there i keep a little saw and uh, usually i'll also keep my radiator block outs in there if i don't need them and there's some extra room in there for a tug strap or or uh other things i also really like the timber sled storage bag for the front you know that's a a great uh, storage option and then they have some other options out there too for um for your kit so check out their website they've got a lot of different options um I'll quickly talk about fuel tanks. This one I like lots, made by LC, and it's like a $30 tank. The mount is like 20 bucks. And then the company that makes these uh, straps is called M2. And if you go to their website, it's a little, sometimes a little hard to navigate, but their website has a, a variety of different options. And the nice thing about these straps is they come undone really easy. And... It's just a really great little strap system for uh, for these tanks, and I think they're like thirty bucks. They're pretty pretty affordable. And they're ratcheting. Uh, one thing, if you get this LC tank, definitely change out the the hose. The hose that they come with is kind of uh, very very firm and, and short and I like to put a nice longer flexible hose on there so that it's just easier to to do fill-ups um, and speaking of gas tanks we found that having the gas tank mounted here with the exhaust sometimes you get a hot corner right here and I have seen a few tanks actually get destroyed out in the field they melt and uh, it became an issue enough where uh, Fastway makes these pro moto billet end caps. They make one that just shoots out uh, straight, but then they have this side shooter, and that eliminates this problem of exhaust pattering on your on your tank. Um, great little mod, nice and easy to do. Probably takes five minutes to to change out all these these screws, but prevents a tank failure out in the field. Uh, the last thing I would consider getting to to make your life easier, just getting in and out of the truck and loading, is the timber sled dolly. Uh, these dollies pivot. They're super awesome. They make life a lot easier when you're moving your bike around the shop or when you're loading or unloading into your trailers or your trucks. And uh, highly recommend it. Timber sled also sells the, the ramp and they have a great skid on there so that it gets tons of traction for your track. I highly recommend it. It's a folding ramp. Um, so yeah, that pretty much summarizes what I've done to the bike. And I think for some of you, you might still have some questions about setup or maybe I didn't quite cover something in, in detail. And so again, please feel free to leave your comments down in the uh, the comments and I'll try my best to get back to you and uh, answer those and until then Happy Brappin enjoy the season and again consider subscribing to the snow bike channel This really helps promote the channel and and uh, keeps me motivated to continue making these videos and so appreciate your support and Have a great season. Take care